So I, I don't, I don't remember this at all. Found it. In cherished memory of Berwick James Longman and John James Longman. And that's my, my grandfather and my dad. And my grandfather died in 1979 and then my dad in 1996. And they both took their own lives. And it's weird standing here and seeing, I'm named after both of them, Beric James, John James, seeing my name on that grave. My grandfather discovered he had bone cancer and sadly shot himself. When I was nine, my father, who had schizophrenia, set light to his flat and died. Now in my twenties, I myself get bouts of depression. How, how do we inherit, do we inherit mental health issues? I'd like to know. One in four people in the UK will experience a mental health issue at some point in their lives. One in 10 will feel anxious or depression. And the most startling statistic of all is that uh, men under 45, for men under 45, suicide is the biggest killer. Kills more men than anything else. And for those between the ages of 18 and 24, it's one of the biggest killers as well. For all those reasons, I made this film. I've wanted to know all of my life about what happened to my dad, and what happened to his dad. Just to let you know, I don't cover health journalism. I'm, a, I'm actually an Arabist. I spend my time in the Middle East reporting on issues around Syria and terrorism. This is not something that I'm used to doing, certainly not something that I'm used to doing and talking about myself. Journalists, we tell other people's stories, we don't tell our own. But I wanted to do this because I really feel that it's really important. So why did I make it? Well, I have dealt with depression, I would say, most of my, most of my adult life. It started when I was in my 20s. I'm still, thankfully, in my 20s for another month, by the way. Um, it started when I was in my early 20s, and then about three years ago, I got rather serious panic attack at work. I started breathing very heavily, I started crying, and I called 111, and, which is the non-emergency service in the UK, and they said, there's a, there's a place near your work where you can go, where someone will treat you, and I thought, good. So I was kind of crying, it was kind of dramatic. I got there, they said, I'm afraid it isn't here, you're not supposed to come here. Here's an, there's another place you can go. And so I went there, and they said, no, no, it's not here either. Why were you sent here? And I was given a number. I, called the, I, I made to call the number in the reception of this place, and they said, this woman barked at me, and she said, get out, You're not, you can't make phone calls in here. I then went outside, I sat on the curb, and for about 20 minutes, I seriously considered walking out uh, in front of traffic. I, I don't know why, I, I didn't do it. Uh, I later found my way to a GP who asked me why, and I said, well, I couldn't be bothered. Not being bothered to kill yourself is not a great place to be. And it really made me realize, and there's been a lot of talk here over the last couple of days about how we're all white liberals and we're out of touch and we don't know anything about the rest of the world. I think that probably did apply to me until I tried to access a mental health service, and I couldn't. Lots of people are in that boat. That's why I made this film. I also managed to speak with Lucy and Johnny. They appear in the rest of the film. I'm not going to tell you what happens. You can, you can go to my Twitter account where you'll find a link to the film and you can watch it and share it. Um, but I spoke to people, a, a set of twins, one of whom has bipolar and the other one doesn't. I also spoke to my mother in the film, um, which was quite an experience. She is also depressed uh, and likes to put on the histrionics as well. So I was sitting in this interview thinking, God, she's going to go nuts. I'm going to have to deal with this woman who's going to fly off the handle. And poor thing, she was sat there with notes on my dad. And she really wanted to put out this image of him being you know, a, a good person, which he was. Uh, and then actually 15 minutes in, I had to be like, sorry, have you had media training? What is this? We, you, know, you need to give me a little bit more emotion. So we had to turn that up a notch. Um, it was very cathartic. And I think my major issue about this which, as a journalist, 
I think you'll share if you ever do stories or if you have done stories on yourself, is that you don't want it to seem overindulgent. You don't want it to seem, oh God, woe is me, this is my life. You've got to have a story, and, and crucially, you've got to have a question you want to answer. And hopefully I did that, the question of genetics, the question of, do I get down because I know that my father killed himself, or do I get down because I've inherited something from him? The most wonderful message I got was this one. I'm going to read it to you. I was listening to the news tonight, and I heard your report on Syria. And as your grandmother Nancy told me you studied Arabic at university, I wondered if you were John's son, and you are. I was John's girlfriend at Camberwell. We both studied fine art together, lived together in various slummy houses in southeast London, and eventually learned to meditate together. I came to your christening after he had attempted suicide and to his funeral. I'm so sorry I never kept in touch. I loved him as perhaps my closest friend. When my daughter Anna became epileptic in her childhood, he stayed with me in hospital and kept me from the abyss. He was a beautiful, intelligent man, absolutely unselfish, generous, totally unmaterialistic, and completely idealistic. I can't tell you how much that meant, getting that message from that woman. And we're now in touch. I got messages from people in New Zealand who knew him as well. But more importantly, as a journalist, I got messages from people I didn't know, who felt that because I had put myself in the story, somehow it meant something to them. I don't think we realize our power sometimes as individuals who just happen to be on television or on the internet or wherever else where we're telling stories. People really, really respect it. And we've talked about selfie journalism here. It's a little bit like that. You've got to make sure it's not indulgent, like I said, and you've got to make sure that you know, you're, you're answering questions. But I think really pe people do really respect the idea that someone on television could tell them something about themselves. So how do I think mental health can be better covered? Well, first of all, I think we need to try to move away from calling it mental health, because we don't call it physical health, we just call it health. Mental health is a, is a health issue. It is not, it's a social one, but it's also a health one. And I don't know about you, but I look at web news websites sometimes, and I see the way that, even the way, and this is something that people maybe think about here, the way that you, you frame mental health, when you look on a, on a news website, you'll see the news and you'll see the sport, and then you'll see health and education. And somewhere over here, maybe with social issues like abortion and euthanasia, gay rights, things that really matter, but ultimately these are social issues. Mental health is an afterthought. It's somehow relegated to this sort of lesser news item. It shouldn't be. It's a massive problem, and it's only getting worse in our society. And we're doing our audience a disservice if we treat it like that, when we've seen in the UK anyway massive cuts to mental health funding. So our audience won't realize what's happening until it's too late. It needs to go further up the agenda. The other thing is solutions-based journalism really helps for something like this. And I like to think that what I did was a bit solutions-based. My dad killed himself. His dad killed himself. What am I doing so far in my 29 years that means that I haven't killed myself yet? Um, well, talking about it, that's one thing. And there's a lot, a lot of things in the film where I go and get my brain scanned, and we talk about how our brains are healing themselves. So, so give people some hope, some happy endings. People who suffer mental health are so varied. They're as varied as we are as human beings. And the reasons why they suffer from it are also as varied as they are. So I think that these sorts of films where people are rocking up and down in a corner crying, really unhelpful. Give people some hope. And also, don't only cover mental health stories when a celebrity gets down. That's not... I don't think that helps. I think that people, people want their own stories told. So things to think to live you with, because I'm going to give you some time if you've got questions to ask me. But to leave you with, think about mental health as a health issue, not just a social one. Think about stories that show hope and not just despair. The audience reacts to these and they share them. They share audience, they share stories about hope. I'm, I'm doing a story at the moment on a boy in Syria who tried to kill himself. He's 15, he lives in a besieged part of the country. It's a ter terrible, terrible story. But I get so many messages of, of love and support for him that we're going to do a second story, and we're going to have him read those messages from people all over the world who care about him. That will get shared a lot, I can imagine, because people like to feel they're engaged. And remember, finally, remember how important all this is, because mental health services are being massively cut in Western Europe, and we're doing our audience a disservice if we're no longer speaking truth to power. Thank you very much.
And as there's five minutes, if people have got questions, they're very welcome to ask me them. If they don't want to, then they can find me afterwards. Please. And if you do have a question, please would you stand up and hopefully someone with a microphone might appear and you can say your name. Thanks, James. My name's Julie Pizzetti from Fairfax Media in Australia. That was incredibly powerful and rare. Um, I'm wondering, though, what sort of response you, you have received from inside the BBC, from the newsrooms um, in which you operate, because you've, you know, you've made yourself very vulnerable and, and it's been a very raw experience, but how ready really are we as, as uh, journalists and newsrooms to deal with this issue? Well, let me tell you that the day after that went out, I had... So I can't tell you how many colleagues came up to me and told me what they deal with. I had people I didn't know hug me, which is a very rare thing in the UK. Let me tell you, we are all as constipated people. We do not do that. Um, came up and, and, you know, just hugged me and said, my father, my uncle, my brother, my sister, they've all been through this. The thing I say over and over again to people is that it's so common. I don't have any problem with talking to people about it. If I had diabetes, I'd be up here. If I had cancer, I'd be up here. I happen to have get down every now and again, and I'm happy to talk about it. The difference is that people who suffer with these issues don't talk about them, so it helps them if I do. The issue about what, I, what it's been like, some of my bosses, I'm very lucky. I have uh, bosses, one of whom is in this room, who has been massively supportive to me. Um, the, the thing is, if you talk about these things at work, that's the message, it's always the message. I know some of you may have been expecting me to talk about the issues that journalists feel with PTSD and the help that they can, they can get in the newsroom. I know that there's a, there's a hotline at the BBC, there's access. Whenever I felt down, I was able to access that hotline. I know other newsrooms do the same. Um, it's only made my relationship with my colleagues better. That's, that's my feedback on that. Anyone else? From RT. You mentioned post-traumatic stress disorder, and you mentioned that you work in Syria and that part of the world. Are you talking about post-traumatic stress disorder? Or what is the difference between that and what you're defining as mental health? How are the two impacting on each other? Well, for me, and that's a conversation that, my, I, was, that I had people uh, make with me after because of the work I do. I look at pictures of... All, I mean, we've all seen these pictures coming out of Syria, and they're horrific, and it, it can trigger something in you. Um, we at the BBC have uh, all sorts of people who make sure that people aren't looking at images they shouldn't be looking at and are continually talking with, uh, with, with their bosses about these sorts of issues. I mean, I don't think I'm qualified to talk properly about PTSD, but I know that um, it can be something which really, really deeply affects people even many years after they've been in, in areas of conflict or even if they're looking at horrific images. Journalists are part of this group of creatives who like to think perhaps that they're more susceptible to... I think depression and mental health illness, I think that's probably not true, because if one in four people gets a mental health illness, I mean, there aren't one in four people in the world who are journalists, so everyone gets it, everyone gets down. The key for us is that we can talk about it, I hope, because we're articulate people who like to talk about themselves sometimes. Anyone else? I've got one minute, go for it. Hi. Was it hard for you to convince uh, your boss to do something completely out of your usual field? No. And did they put any conditions? No. Oh. Just, as, just as long as I was, I was happy to do it and I felt supported, which I was. Um, my, my big issue was, like I said, not feeling like it was just all about me. And if you watch the film, you'll see, hopefully, there's some science in there. And I wanted to make sure she kept going on, yeah, get your mum in it a bit more. And I'd be like, hmm. Less mum, more science, right? We don't need to beat people over the head with the fact that my family's nuts. We, you know, we can, we can move forward a little bit, yeah. But anyway, no, I was massively supported, and I think people would find the same... Uh, I hope that people would find the same in, in, in the places where they work. So that's it from me, I think. But thank you very much for your time, and uh, have a look on Twitter.